Okay, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, so I think we will continue our discussions on convolutional networks, like which we started in the last week. Uh, so let me share my iPad. Okay, so I would like to start with a quick recap uh, of like what we saw in the previous week. So we were looking at convolutional neural nets, right? So where the basic idea is any normal like learning algorithm, like model that we have seen so far takes the input and vectorizes it and only works in vector space, right? Like, so you give a vector as the input. On the other hand, like when you consider an image which has a bunch of pixels, right? So let's just say this is a five cross five image, right? So there are like five pixels, like five cross five uh, image, like which could have like three channels. If it is like a color image, you also have the red, green and blue channel, right? So now there's a structure in this image and I want to capture this structure while I'm trying to come up with a predictive model. So the, that is that was inspiration for convolutional neural networks. So, so what convolutional neural networks are doing is instead of having a fully connected layer, which is going to have connection with the entire image unit, in this case, like the image is going to be phi cross phi cross three, right? So we take this phi cross phi cross three, we vectorize it, and then we pass it to the fully connected layer. Instead of that, what convolutional neural network is doing is it is proposing to have a layer, we are going to call this as the con layer, okay? Which is going to have a bunch of filters, right? So one, two, let's say we have K filters, okay? So we're going to have K filters and each of this filter is going to be of a smaller resolution when compared to the image, okay? So in this case, like I have taken like a two cross, two cross, three filter, okay? So now this is a two cross, two cross, three filter. Now, in the last lecture, we saw in detail, like, so how are we going to use this two cross, two cross, three feature? And actually, uh, like first convolve over this, right? Like you'll do the dot product of the feature, which is this part. Then if your stride is one, you move to this region, right? Like you're you are moving one at a time. And also similarly, you will move below like this, right? On the other hand, uh, let's say my stride is two. In that case, like I will take two steps away. So I'll do a dot product of this with this and this with this and so on, okay? Now, when I continue like this, you see that after the second stride, I cannot do the third stride because there's only one column left, right? So to avoid these kind of issues, like we also learned about zero padding. So we can actually add zeros to the corners of the image, right? So that we actually have more space to do this convolution, like do these dot products, okay? Now, can someone tell me what was the other reason we used zero padding? Like one reason is to make valid dot products, but what was the other reason we were interested in using zero padding? To keep the same dimension, right? Like, so the one, one effect of convolution is like, since you are, as you ask the, as the, okay, maybe let's do a small quiz, okay? So I'm going to do a template poll. So the question is, as I increase the value of the stride, okay, now the output, resolution will increase or decrease. Okay, so that is my question. So let me use the template poll. So maybe I'll write a bit here. So let's compare two things. Like what happens as I increase the value of stride? So the stride could be one, two, three, and so on, right? So as I keep increasing the value of the stride, the resolution of the output, the a, increase, B, decrease. A for increase, B for decrease. Okay, it looks like all of you are preparing for your end terms. So we have 
majority of you like a okay i'll stop the poll 85 percentage of you think that it is b it's decreasing right so which is correct so as uh, you can see here that like as i as i increase my like stride sizes like the number of values that i'm generating is less so eventually i'm going to have a smaller um, image output right okay so now there are many factors here so let's just try to summarize what we have discussed so far okay so now usually the con layer is going to accept some input let's say the size of the input is w1 cross h1 cross d1 this is the width height and depth okay depth is the number of channels now there are four hyperparameters that we have discussed so far can can you guys list the hyperparameters of a con layer in the chat stride okay very good what else zero padding okay so let's just call stride to be s zero padding to be p number of filters that's correct so number of filters let's say k what is the fourth one uh no not the number of layers we are talking about one layer size of the convolution matrix which is kind of like what is the size of this thing right so so what is the size of this matrix so that is the size of the convolution matrix so we are going to call that as the spatial extent okay let's just call that as f okay now we know how to define this layer so once you have this layer now this layer is going to produce an output this output is going to be another image of shape w2 cross h2 cross d2 okay where d2 is basically the number of channels in the output which is exactly the number of filters that we have so it's k okay but for w2 and h2 we learned a formula last week right like so w2 is given by w1 minus f plus 2p by s plus 1 similarly h2 is given by h1 minus f plus 2p by s plus 1 right so now one way to look at convolutional networks is like we are creating this filter right and we are sharing this filter across several regions in my image right so uh, in some sense we are doing parameter sharing okay so essentially we only need f cross f cross d1 weights per filter okay and also like an extra bias term right so so totally if you have k filters then you have f cross f cross d1 times k plus k parameters okay now just to give you an example like for example let's say i have an input which is 227 cross 227 cross 3 it's a decent size image okay now if i have the first con layer which is having f is equal to 11 so it's 11 cross 11 convolution stride 4 no zero padding 96 filters okay now you can do the calculation the output is going to be something like 55 cross 55 cross 96 okay now if you don't have parameter sharing okay so without parameter sharing you would end up having 55 cross 55 cross 96 cross 11 cross 11 cross 3 plus 1 okay so this is totally 105 705 600 parameters in the first layer if you don't do parameter sharing you are going to have this many parameters which is a lot of parameters on the other hand if i do parameter sharing which is what we normally do 
then you only need 96 times 11 cross 11 cross 3 plus 96, which is totally roughly 35k parameters. You, now you can see the advantage of using a convolutional network. So like instead of having like 100 million parameters, like I only need 35,000 parameters, which is a huge saving. And hence there's going to be less overfitting when compared to using a fully connected network for like using images, which has 227 cross 227 resolution. Okay. Okay. Now, what are these features, right? Like, so like, like, what are these filters? Like, how are these filters going to look like? So here is some visualization of the filters in first layer. Okay. So remember that like you take this filter and you do a dot product with one part of the image, right? So when you have the dot product value to be higher, it just means that that image is looking very similar to this filter. So in, or in other words, these first layer filters are actually learning some basic visual concepts. Like some of them are like edges, right? Like, and some of them are patterns. Some of them are actually colors, right? Like, so this one, for example, is learning to recognize the pink color. This one is learning to recognize the green color. And this one is learning to recognize like stripes, right? So every filter is learning to recognize some basic concepts in image, right? Like, so now remember that this is the first con layer. Now you can take the output of this first con layer and give it to the second con layer. So the second con layer is going to learn some new concepts on the top of this. So in other words, if the first con layer is learning the edges, then the second layer could learn to recognize boxes. And the third could learn to recognize a complete car, for example. So as you increase the number of layers in the continents, you are going to learn more and more visually interesting concepts. Okay, so are there any questions about the convolution layer before we move to the next type of layer? Any questions in chat or hand raise? Okay, how do we do SGD with it? That's a good question. So now, is there any, okay, so I have explained you the structure, right? Like, but is there anything special in this architecture that we cannot compute gradients? So one thing that I did not do in this class uh, or, or even in this course is giving you the exact equation of how this layer would work, right? Like, so, so whatever idea that I described to you, like where like you move like one, uh, like you move through the image, like one piece at a time. So this can be efficiently implemented by using the convolution operation. Okay, now this convolution is a linear operator. So you can compute gradients with respect to parameters of con layer and do SGD easily. And I am sure all of you attended the PyTorch tutorial, right? Like, so if you are using a package like PyTorch, it is going to compute the gradient for con layer by itself. Like you don't need to do anything. Any other questions? Okay, so I would like to discuss about, okay, so don't we need SGD also to learn the filters? Oh, that's what I meant by, okay. So when I say a con layer, it is just a bunch of filters. So we will be using SGD to learn the parameters of the filters. And you can compute gradient of your loss with respect to the parameters of the filters. Is that fine? Okay. Okay. So now before we conclude our discussions on corners, like I would also like to introduce another type of layer, which is commonly used along with corners, which is the idea of pooling layer. Okay. So in general, like if you have seen the type of corners that people used five, six years back, probably no, probably no one 
uses pooling nowadays, but there are still some uh, architectures where you could see pooling. Uh, but the basic idea here is that it's very common that you would see people using one con layer followed by a pooling layer followed by a con layer pooling layer and so on okay so in general people insert pooling layers in between the con layers okay so now the main advantage of the pooling layer is to actually reduce the spatial size of the representation so pooling layer is mostly used for reduction Okay, so now let me explain you how pooling layer works. Um, then like you will understand why it is used for reduction. Okay, so here in the right side, you actually see that this is my input, which is four cross four. Okay, now when I do pooling, so in this case, I'm doing a specific type of pooling called max pooling, okay, which has two cross two filter and a stride of two. Okay, so what it is going to do is it's going to take the first two cross two and compute the maximum value in this two cross two. The maximum here is six, right? So you, you put six here. Then the stride is two, so stride one, stride two. So you go here. Now you take the second two cross two, compute the max, it goes here. You go to the next two cross two, you compute the max, it goes here. The next two cross two, you compute the max and it goes here. Okay, so now a four cross four image has suddenly become a two cross two image, right? Okay, now can someone tell me what is the parameter of this max pool operation? No parameter, that's the right answer, right? Like max is not the parameter and Stride is the hyperparameter here, right? Like, so there is no parameter to learn with this operator, okay? So it's, it's an easy operator to use. Like there's no parameter, like this is purely used for reducing the size, okay? So here, like in the left side, you can see like how it works, right? Like, so for example, like I took a 224 cross 224 image and I downsampled it to 112 cross 112 by just max pooling, okay? So whenever you want to reduce the size of the image, you could use a pooling operator, okay? Now max pooling, as I described here, is just computing the max, right? So similarly, like there are other pooling operators available. Like for example, you could do average pooling, in which case you just compute the average of all the entries in the two cross store. Like similarly, you could do L2 norm pooling where you take the L2 norm and so on, okay? Um, is there a min pooling? That's a good point. Um, well, I am not sure. Um, I could do a quick search. Maybe there's a min pooling. I'm not sure. Like uh, if someone finds if there is a min pooling, you can put the link in the chat, but there are like, tens of 20, 10 or 20 types of pooling operators available. So you could use any pooling operator. Um, okay, so there's a question, why is it not used anymore? That's a good point. So the current trend is to actually just use bigger strides. Instead of pooling. Okay, so yeah, pooling was used probably, I don't know, like probably like five, 10 years back, it was a very normal thing. Like you would see a pooling layer in the continent. continent. Uh, it is just that like uh, over time we found that you don't really need the pooling layer. You could just do bigger strides. So uh, we just do uh, simple uh, con, la con layers. So how, okay, so there's another good question. So how do we perform SGD if we have a pooling layer in between? So, um, okay, so this is just a max operation and um, you could pass gradients through pooling layers. So probably we will not talk about that in this lecture, uh, but I would encourage you to go look for uh, like how gradients are passed through pooling layer, but you can do SGD, okay?
Okay, so now here is an example coordinate. So like you can see that this coordinate takes the image, right? And there's a first corn layer, then followed by a ReLU layer. So remember that as I said, corn is a linear operator. So just having convolution in it is not enough. You need some nonlinearity. So you add ReLU layer, then a corn, then ReLU, then you do some pooling. Then again, corn ReLU, corn ReLU, pooling, right? So, so normally, like this is kind of common thing that you would see in many convolutional architectures. Like, so you would have this one block and then you just repeat the block two times, three times. And finally, you have a fully connected layer. In this case, it's a five class problem. So given an image, it computes the probability for one of the five classes. Okay. So now I think maybe some of you are already trying convolutional networks in the Kaggle competition. Uh, if you are not, I would enc highly encourage you to try them. Like, so you it should be very easy for you to implement one in like PyTorch, like where you don't need to compute the gradient by yourself. Okay. Uh, okay, so is there any questions before the wrap up convolutional networks? There was a question earlier yeah uh, which asks the filters in the same layer should be the same size yeah. they have to be right so um well i think it's just easier for your correlation operation if they are not in the same if they're not in the same size then you need to do your manual implementation Normally they are same size. Okay, so there is a question. Pooling layers goal is to reduce computational load. How the CNN will perform if we do not use pooling layers any longer? Okay, so yeah, as I said, like instead of doing pooling, you could just do aggressive striding. You increase your stride, you are going to automatically reduce the computational load and the memory usage. Uh, but there's nothing stopping you from trying using pooling. And there are still architectures where like you would see pooling once in a while. Okay, so that is fine. Now we are going to switch gears, okay? And look at a different learning paradigm, which is the idea of Bayesian learning. So, so far, we discussed several types of classification algorithms, right? Like, so we have discussed simple discriminative models like logistic regression or like slightly more complex nonlinear discriminative models like neural networks, right? Like, and we also looked at discriminant based models like SVMs or perceptrons and so on, right? Like, and we also looked at generative models like uh, Nabase or um, other algorithms that we have seen so far, right? So we have discussed a lot of learning algorithms and most of these learning algorithms were in fact based on the idea of empirical risk minimization, right? So which is something that we started discussing in the beginning of the course and which came up again and again, right? Like, so which is the idea of empirical risk minimization. Now, also the one common flavor in all the learning algorithms that we have seen so far is some, somehow we defined this concept of likelihood and then we were just maximizing the likelihood or minimizing the negative log likelihood. And we also discussed that maximizing the log likelihood could have overfitting issues, right? Like, and at some point, if you remember like uh, the previous lectures, I told you that this is not the only estimator. Uh, there are actually other ways to learn and we will do look at them like later in the course. So that is what we are going to do in today's lecture. Okay. Okay. So maybe first I would like to set some notations here. Okay. So now let us consider a family of probability models. Okay. For the data X, which is indexed by 
parameter theta. So I have a bunch of models, each indexed by some parameter theta. So for every possible value of theta, I have a model. Okay. Now, similarly, there is also a procedure. Okay. Which generated the data. Okay. So let, and the decision function. Okay. So let's just call it as del of x. Okay. So this del of x operates on the data to produce the decision. Okay, now normally we define some loss function and this loss function is given by del of x comma theta, right? So now there are two arguments to this loss function, right? Like, so one is the procedure which generated the labels it is going to give me some labels, y, right? Now there is also this parameter theta for the model, which is going to make some prediction y, okay? Now our goal is to use this loss function to compare different procedures and tell me which is the best model to do, the model to use, whichever has the lowest generalization error, right? But there is a problem here. Like we know that like, if you, if you observe these two parameters, right, like arguments here, so both of these arguments are unknown. We don't know the data which generated the process, like we generated the, the, the we don't know the process which generated the data. Similarly, we also don't know which theta to use, right? So, so far, what we have been seeing it can be called as frequentist approach, okay? Which is this philosophy that we will treat del of x as random, okay? So if you remember all our discussions on empirical risk minimization and statistical decision theory, the expectations were always over x and y. Right, so, so both in our empirical risk minimization and the statistical decision theory, whenever I mentioned expectation, the expectation was with respect to X and Y. So this assumes that the data is random, okay? So this assumes that the data or the data generating process is random. Okay. However, there is an alternative approach to look at this problem, which is what we are going to call as the Bayesian approach. Okay. In this case, they're going to treat, they're going to consider data is given to us. Okay. So we don't assume anything about the data but we're going to treat theta as random. Okay, now this is completely different view. In the first view, which is what we have been focusing a lot in this course so far, like we always treated data to be random and the data generating process to be random, right? However, there is an alternate view, which is the Bayesian approach that we will treat theta as random. In this case, the inference is just made conditional on the current data. Okay. Okay, so this is fine. So now let's revisit some of the concepts that we have learned so far and actually look at it from this new point of view, okay? Instead of data being random, what if my parameters are random, okay? now. We are going to talk again about parameter estimation. Okay, so whenever I use a parametric model for a prediction problem, okay, I use a parametric model for the prediction 
problem. Okay, so then there are two inference problems actually. Okay, so the first one is to estimate the value for theta that can explain the data. So first step is to compute the value for theta, which is what we have been doing by using gradient descent so far, right? Like so, so given some data, I want to compute the parameter theta of the model. Now there is a second inference problem, which is, okay, I have learned the parameter theta, okay, but why do I learn this parameter theta? So that is not our end goal, right? Like our end goal is actually to come up with new prediction, right? So basically to calculate the probability of new observations x hat okay given previous observations okay which is going to be something like p of x given x hat okay so now this is actually even though we always focus on this aspect our goal is actually this right like so we don't care about the theta what we actually care about is coming up with a good prediction for the new uh, example right like so we are going to call problem one as the estimation problem. Okay, and we are going to call problem two as prediction problem. Okay, is that clear? Okay, so now let's say someone gave me some data set. I'm just going to focus on XI here, but there is a corresponding YI, okay? So, so let's say I have a data set which has a bunch of examples, okay? Which are all independent and identically distributed realizations of some random variable X, okay? Now, the data set is IID, okay? Now I have some parametric model. And let's say this parametric model has some parameter theta. Okay, now we are going to assume that theta is now random, right? Which means now theta is going to follow some distribution. Okay, for example, the most common distribution that we would assume is Gaussian distribution. Let's say, let's say my parameters comes from a Gaussian distribution. Now, then theta is going to be dependent on mu and sigma square of this Gaussian, right? Okay, now, once I start looking at, from this point of view that my theta is random, now I could use Bayes rule, but here we are going to use it in a different sense than the way in which we used previously. If you remember the last time we used Bayes rule, it was like for probability of y given x, right? In this case, we are going to do probability of my parameter theta given the data, okay? Now this is equal to probability of x given theta, p of theta by p of x. So p of theta given x is my posterior. It tells me what is the probability of my current parameter theta given that I have observed this trading data. Okay, now this term is the likelihood term, which tells me what is the probability of this data set given that this is my parameter theta. Now P of theta is the prior distribution over the parameters. Okay, and P of X is often called as evidence. Okay, so the other way to put this base rule is posterior is equal to likelihood multiplied by prior divided by evidence. Okay, is that clear? Okay, so now with this notations, let's look at what maximum likelihood estimation is doing. 
okay? So we have seen maximum likelihood estimation, like almost in every single model that we have seen so far, right? Like, so the basic idea here is to find the parameters that maximize the likelihood. Right? So now let's just call the likelihood to be L, okay? Now this is defined as the probability of the data given theta, okay? Now this is basically product over all possible examples, probability of X given theta. And often we will use log likelihood instead of likelihood just to make the product as a sum, right? So let's define log likelihood. So the scripted L to be log of L, okay? Now, what is Emily trying to do? Emily is trying to find this parameter, let's just call it theta ML, which is nothing but org max of L of theta given X, right? So find these parameters theta, which maximizes the log likelihood. Like you yeah, can just expand this and say org max of theta, summation over X belonging to X log P of X given theta. Okay, so now this is what we were normally doing. Okay, okay. So now once you have your maximum likelihood estimate theta. So how are we going to use, how are we going to use theta ML to make new predictions? Right? Uh, is X dependent on theta? No, X is the data. Okay, how are we going to use this? theta, right? So, so now what we are interested in is the second problem, which is the inference problem, which is probability of new X given cap the data, right? Now this is nothing but integral over all possible theta, P of X given theta, P of theta given the data, right? So I'm interested in finding the like, making prediction for the new X given the data set. Now given the data set, now you would first learn the parameter theta and then using the theta, you will make a new prediction, right? So now if you want to compute this probability, you have to integrate over all possible thetas that you have, okay? So now let me cut this to the next page. Okay. So now what is maximum likelihood estimation is doing is essentially to approximate this theta by using theta ML, okay? So P of X hat given theta ML, probability of theta given X D theta, okay? Now I can bring the X hat given theta ML outside, integral theta over theta, P of theta given X D theta. Can someone tell me what is this integral? What is this integral value? It's one, right? Because it's integral over all possible theta, P of theta. So this is exactly one. So this is one. So this just becomes P of X given theta. Okay. So this is what we have been doing implicitly so far in the course, right? Like, so we did not realize that we are approximating the inference process by using this maximum likelihood estimator, okay? So now that we have a framework to analyze this, like now we can actually ask this question, okay, how can I do better? So what can I do, sorry, what can I do instead of just maximizing the likelihood and making this approximation, okay? So before we discuss what, what more can we do? We are going to see an example for maximum likelihood estimation. It's, it's not, it's going to be an easy example because we have already seen a lot of examples for maximum likelihood estimation. Uh, but before that, uh, probably we will stop here um, to...
to one of the most important um, activities, which is the final course evaluation. Okay, so I will stop the recording.